Uh, my subject for Sunday school, and what time are we done, Pastor? At quarter two, okay? Uh, so we have a little bit of extra time here this morning, so that's really wonderful. And you said right is forward and left is backward. Israel's future and the problem with replacement theology. Now let me ask you this. Uh, how many of you have ever, you, obviously you probably have, but how many of you have ever heard of the doctrine of replacement theology? Okay, so this is fertile ground here for that subject for sure. Uh, I, I don't blame you at all because I have asked a number of pastors as we do our ministry and travel, what do you know about the doctrine of replacement theology? And most of them, most of them will say, well, I've never really looked into that, so I wouldn't really know. And so it's a subject that is vital, it's important, but it's not something that's commonly known. And so I'd like to kick off our prophecy conference by talking about that. But the first thing that I want us to think about is the future of Israel. Uh, the, the future of Israel itself. Now, this is a subject that I'm sure that you all are aware of. Uh, God called a man out of Ur of the Chaldees. And I just simply like to say God called... Abram out of Iraq. That puts it into our modern setting. I remember saying that at a real estate meeting and our district manager happened to be there to talk to all the realtors and, and I just mentioned that one time God called Abram out of Iraq and brought him into a land called now called Israel. It wasn't called that at that time but came over and his immediate response was Abraham is Iraqi? Well, I don't know if you knew that or not. You all know from Sunday school that he came from Mesopotamia. And that was the ancient name for the country where he lived. But we like to just put it into the modern map so we know where we're coming from. And so God called him to leave Ur of the Chaldees, ultimately buried his father up in northern Iraq, and then landed up at the northern part of Israel and came down to the south part and there had his meeting together with Lot and he began his family after some time. You know the complications. Abram and Sarah grew old and they were beyond the childbearing age and so God said, but I have promised you a son and I'm going to give you a son and you know the story about how Abram decided that he needed to fulfill the will of God and he messed up big time by giving us Ishmael and coming out of Abraham and his and made, the Bible calls her, housekeeper, the cook, and whatever else she did. She became his wife, second wife, sort of, and they had a child, thinking that this would be the plan of God. How often we can mess up by trying to fix up the plan of God or trying to add to the plan of God. And uh, so now we have the Ishmaelites all over the world today. It has been said that the greater threat to freedom and the greater threat to our Western world is not Russia, it is not China, but it is the growing forces of Islam. And there is so much of the Ishmaelite in Islamic belief, and their idea is dominance. That's the name of Islam, that's the meaning of it, and they were hoping someday to dominate the world. They're inching up and they're creeping up that way. They're a dangerous force to be reckoned with. But there's something much greater than all of that, and that was that God gave to Abraham and to Sarah a little precious boy, and his name was Isaac. In Abraham, in Isaac, and then in Isaac's son Jacob, these are the promises of God, covenants that God made uh, giving them the inheritance of the land, giving them the, the promise of Messiah, giving them the promise of future. This is all something that came to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I remember back in the early 70s hearing a preacher in Chicago making fun of pastors who prayed and talked about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I had studied dispensationalism enough to know that this was just a tiny bit offensive to me 
because how do we know which God we serve? How do we know which God is true? And the Bible identifies him as the same God that called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, gave to him his son Isaac, and to Isaac he gave Jacob, and to Jacob he gave 12 sons and one daughter. The daughter didn't inherit any land, but the 12 sons did. So throughout your Old Testament, you have the uh, nations, the nation of Israel with the land division that took place uh, in the Old Testament and uh, the conquering of the land was, uh, it was really vicious. It was something that you don't like you know, to read about a lot and that leads some modern day preachers to say we shouldn't even preach from the Old Testament. And uh, my, act, my answer to that is Yes, we need to preach from the Old Testament because it is the foundation of all. <coughs> the Christianity that you and I have is called a Ju Judeo-Christian belief because it's founded on what God said to the Jew and then ultimately was brought to us through the person of Christ and the apostolic writings that we have in the New Testament. So this is just something I want to show to you. We're going to do it very quickly. We obviously won't have time to read everything that's, uh, that's on the screen today. But I do want us to look at, and did you say the yellow one was the, uh, which was the light, Pastor? Uh, the last, okay. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to talk a little bit about this portion over here. Uh, but But I want us to move ahead and just to mention to you that we're going to let the scriptures speak. We have Ezekiel chapter 48 verses 1 through 29. We have uh, Jeremiah 31 verses 35 to 37 and then we will have Romans chapter 11 verses 25 through 27. These are not all the scriptures that relate to Israel and its future. But these are prominent scriptures. So if you're taking down notes in your little green book today, you might want to write down Ezekiel chapter 48, verses 1 through 29. And then uh, if you want to understand more of this, just simply read that. And all that will do is tell you about the land divisions. You'll notice that these land divisions are pretty much the same as they were in the original. You go through the book of Joshua and Judges and you see how the land was taken by the uh, children of Jacob, the sons of Jacob, Israel, and they occupied the land and it became theirs by promise, but they had to work to occupy it. And so God just led them to do that. Well, when we come to the latter part of the book of Ezekiel, we have a prophecy. What you have in Ezekiel chapter 48 verses 1 through 29 has not yet been fulfilled. This is still future. So as you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll find that there's some fancy stuff there like wheels and fire and chariots and angels and symbolic things that were given to Ezekiel to understand the righteousness, the purity, the holiness of God and his intervention for Judah who would be taken captive to be held in Babylon for 70 years. For them to be in Babylon for 70 years, they needed a priest and Ezekiel was that priest and God ministered to him and through him. Jeremiah, the prophet who had predicted their captivity would not be there, but Ezekiel would be there and he had some really interesting responsibilities given to him as you read through the book of Ezekiel. It's really an interesting book. When you come to Ezekiel chapter 40 and on through chapter 48, you have something very unique and that is that you have a temple described. And so when you read Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, you're seeing the dimensions of this room, the dimensions of that room, the, the windows. Yours are a little bit like the windows that are built in that Ezekiel temple 
it even describes their narrow, maybe this narrow or narrower, it even describes how they're finished. That's because if you're anything to do with real estate, if you're anything to do with buildings or construction, which also is my passion, I appreciate reading Ezekiel 40 to 48. Some of you may say, oh, I'm bored at this. I'm not. I just love reading and say, hey, this is a neat building. And as you read through that, in your mind, you can get a picture of what the Ezekiel temple is going to be all about. Uh, this Ezekiel temple has never been built. So it's an architectural work laid out for us in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, and yet has never seen reality. So when is that temple going to be built? Well, there is a kingdom that is coming to this world. In that kingdom, we will have the presence of Jesus Christ ruling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Israel will be governing the world and will be the top country of the world. And Jesus Christ will be the supreme king of the world. And there is going to be a temple which is going to be specifically designated for the top country of the world, Israel. And that temple is unique like no other temple has ever been built. I like to preach on the temple, which I'll be doing at our prophecy conference in Cambridge, October 28th. I like to go through the steps of the temple and what its significance is because the Bible says much about the temple of God. This one is unique in that Ezekiel describes it, the people will inherit it, and they will sacrifice and they will worship in that temple in the millennial age. Now, I just know that when it comes to question times, there will be some people asking about the sacrifice in the temple that will take place in the kingdom of God that will be here on earth. And uh, it'll be, uh, no, it'll be an interesting interaction. I remember first time when I mentioned that to my sister and she just came apart. She just absolutely melted it. She said, I can't believe this. I can't believe you believe this. I said, well, you read your Bible and you'll believe it too. And anyway, she came down to understand it eventually, but it's not something that people understand immediately. And so it's a complicated thing. But what we have in Ezekiel chapter 48, 1 through 29, is we have the division of the land. And that will be starting way up here with Dan. You will recall that Dan inherited a property somewhere in this area originally. He wasn't happy with it because he didn't think it was enough property for him. And so God led him and took him, and he also developed up here in the Damascus area where Dan then became a territory, he will inherit that in the kingdom age. He doesn't have it now. Syria has that. The Muslims are in charge of that up there. But the they will come when Dan will be the occupier of this territory, and that will be in the millennial age. It is not going to happen now, no matter who the president is of the United States, and no matter who the leader is in Canada, even though we're supportive of Israel, but they are not going to inherit what God has promised them that will take place. Asher is the next one. Naphtali will be the next one. Manasseh will inherit this portion of the land, basically the areas where they have been in history. Ephraim will inherit a large portion of land. Then we have the millennial temple area that's way down here. Reuben inherits, Judah inherits, and then down here, Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulon, and Gad. How many of you have ever heard the term, the lost 10 tribes of Israel? We haven't heard the lost 10 tribes either, okay. Uh, that was when, when I was in college back in the 1960s. That was a big thing. The, lo the 10 tribes of Israel are lost. And so, okay, if they're lost, then we don't know where they are. So if it's lost, can we find it? No, if it's lost, we won't be able to find it. But anyway, as it turns out, they're not as lost as people used to say they are. The fact is that they don't have territory. They don't have the occupancy of their land. So in a sense, they're nomads. You'd probably find a whole whack of them in Montreal. You'll find many of them in Toronto. 
you will find a very huge, probably more in New York City than actually live in the land of Israel right now. And so they're not really lost. You, you can find them here, there, and everywhere. Just the fact is that they don't have the occupancy of the land. But this tells us in Ezekiel chapters 48, 1 through 29. And I'd like you, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read there as quickly as we can. And I'm going to try not to stop too much, just so that we get the word of God, the picture from the scripture telling us about this. We read, now these are the names of the tribes from the north end to the coast of the way of Hethlon as one goes to Hamath, Hazer and Nen, the border of Damascus northward to the coast of Hamath, for these are his sides east and west, a portion for Dan. So that's where you get the term Dan, way up at the north. By the border of Dan, from the east side onto the west side, a portion for Asher. And by the border of Asher, from the east side, even onto the west side, a portion for Naphtali. And by the border of Naphtali, from the east side onto the west side, a portion for Manasseh. And by the border of Manasseh, from the east side onto the west side, a portion for Ephraim. And by the border of Ephraim, from the east side, even onto the west side, a portion for Reuben. And by the border of Reuben, from the east side onto the west side, a portion for Judah. And by the border of Judah, from the east side unto the west side, shall be the offering which you shall offer of five and twenty thousand reeds in breadth, and in length as one of the other parts from the east side unto the west side, and the sanctuary shall be in the midst of it. The sanctuary that's not there now, by the way. The oblation that you shall offer unto the Lord shall be of five and twenty thousand in length and of ten thousand in breadth, and for them, even for the priests, shall be this holy oblation. Toward the north, five and twenty thousand in length, and toward the west, ten thousand in breadth, and toward the east, ten thousand in breadth, and toward the south, five and twenty thousand in length, and the sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the midst thereof. And it shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok, which have kept my charge, which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray as the Levites went astray. And this oblation of the land that is offered shall be unto them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. And over against the border of the priests, the Levites shall have five and twenty thousand in length and ten thousand in breadth. All the length shall be five and twenty thousand and the breadth ten thousand. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange nor alienate the firstfruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. And the five thousand that are left in the breadth over against the five and twenty thousand shall be a profane place for the city, for dwelling, for the suburbs, for the city shall be in the midst thereof. And these shall be the measures thereof, the north side four thousand and five hundred, the side south side 4,500, and on the east side 4,500, and on the west side 4,500. And the suburbs of the city shall be toward the north 250, and toward the south 250, and toward the east 250, and toward the west 250. And the residue in length over against the oblation of the holy portion shall be 10,000 eastward, 10,000 westward, and it shall be over against the oblation of the holy portion, and the increase thereof shall be for food unto them that serve the city. They that serve the city shall serve it out of all the tribes of Israel, not the lost ones, from all the tribes. All the oblation shall be five and twenty thousand by five and twenty thousand. You shall offer the holy oblation four square and with the possession of the city. And the residue shall be for the prince on the one side, and on the other side the holy oblation, and of the possession of the city over against the five and twenty thousand of the oblation toward the east border, and westward over against the five and twenty thousand toward the west border, over against the portions for the prince, and it shall be the holy oblation, and the sanctuary of the house shall be in the midst thereof. Moreover, from the possession of the Levites, and from the possession of the city, being in the midst of that which is the princes between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin shall be for the prince. As for the rest of the tribes, from the east side unto the west side, Benjamin shall have a portion by the border of Benjamin. From the east side unto the west side, Simeon shall have a portion by the border of Simeon. From the east side unto the west side, Issachar a portion 
and by the border of Issachar from the east side unto the west side, Zebulon a portion, and by the border of Zebulon from the east side unto the west side, Gad a portion, and by the border of Gad at the side, south side, southward, the border shall be even from Tamar unto the waters of strife and Kadesh and the river toward the great sea. Now listen to verse 29. This is the land which you shall divide by lot unto the tribes of Israel for inheritance, and these are their portions, saith who? Saith the Lord God. So if I was telling you this, you'd say that's subject to debate, but since God said it, we're just going to settle on this is going to happen. Uh, so this is, this is the promise that God is going to give the land to the nation of Israel. You'd be surprised how many people today do not believe in a future for Israel. Uh, there, are, there are churches uh, throughout our province that do not believe in a future for Israel. Uh, there are institutions that teach contrary to this. And there are a million plus two YouTube sites that teach contrary to this. There are, there are many, many voices today that are saying Israel is finished. Well, if Israel is finished, then there must be a vacuum. And what is the vacuum? Well, the vacuum would allow for all kinds of things so that rather than allow for a vacuum, God gave the church. And so the church then replaced Israel. So there's no need for Israel because the church is God's focal point. This would be extremely ignorant if I were to teach you that. It would be so contrary to the scripture. And yet, this is what is being taught in so many places today. The evangelical world is inundated by it. And uh, that there are some Baptists that don't know much better. And so they are also subject to teaching some things that are not what the Bible teaches us in reference to God's promise to Israel. What is the problem with replacement theology? First of all, let me suggest to you that Adolf Hitler believed in replacement theology. So if you believe anything that Adolf Hitler said or did or taught or, or accomplished in his tyrannical rule, and he was one that believed, of course he was a Roman Catholic of sorts, uh, but the church was the picture of God and the kingdom was church and Israel was debunked completely. That's why he took the liberty to destroy over six million of them. I would say that if your belief about Israel leads you to hate Israel, if your belief about Israel leads you to be willing to kill Israel, you're obviously not in good company with God because it is not the intent of God to destroy Israel. God said, my thoughts toward you are good and not evil. That's even when they were in captivity. He said, it's not for evil purposes that I think about you. I don't discipline you for evil. And so replacement theology came along. Martin Luther, one uh, obviously the voice for the Reformation, the founder of the Lutheran movement, uh, had a great object his purpose was to reach the Jews so that they would become converted to Lutheranism and he would have this very famous Old Testament group of people that would be with him. And when he began to negotiate and talk and teach with the Jews, he soon realized that the Jews don't become Lutherans. I'm not talking individual Jews. I'm talking about the national Jew. The national Jew does not become a Roman Catholic. And by the way, just for interest's sake, the national Jew does not become Baptist. I'm a Baptist all the way through. And I'm not insulted by that because I know God has a program for them. Today, an individual Jew needs to come to Christ 
just as you and I needed to come to Christ. He will not have salvation until he comes to Christ. That's also true nationally for the nation of Israel. They need to come to Christ or they will not inherit this. Well, the fact is they will come to Christ. The fact is that they will inherit this. So is replacement theology dangerous? I would say that it leads towards a neglect of Israel, kind of, it's not important. I mean, so the Old Testament, everything from Exodus all the way through is Israel, Israel, Israel. And so it's not important, let's debunk that. And so because now we have church, let's not talk Israel, and that's where the problem comes in. The, uh, the idea that God is finished with Israel, the replacement theologians say that there was no more need for them. That's one thing about replacement theology. So we have the church. The second part of replacement theology is that God was punishing them, and so he was beating them down because of their disobedience and rebellion, and thus he gave the church. And the other one was just basically God just let them just wither on and we have the church and we no longer need to emphasize Israel. Uh, this, this, the, this is the three components of replacement theology in a nutshell, but uh, they will believe this from one side to the other in their camps. Replacement theology basically believes that when the temple of Israel was destroyed in 70 AD under Titus, the ruler, one of the rulers of Rome, one of the soldiers, came and destroyed the city, came and destroyed the temple, every stone was overturned and it was demolished. They said that was it right there, Israel was finished. Well, what happened was the Sanhedrin in Israel kept on functioning after the 70 AD uh, and up until 425. At 425, they met in Tiberias and they said, we don't have a temple. We don't have anything if we don't have a temple. And so they disbanded the Sanhedrin so that from 425 all the way up until the year 2004, there was no Sanhedrin. And so there was no official ruling body no lawmakers, no law enforcers. So in a sense, Israel had become inactive for all that time. The Muslims, because there's a vacuum, the Muslims came in. They took over the city of Jerusalem. And so what you have today is you have the Mosque of Omar, or X, whatever they call it, over sitting in the very area where the Temple of Solomon was built, where the Temple of Herod was rebuilt where the temple of the tribulation will be built, where the temple of the millennial will be sitting at that time. But the Muslims occupy the center right now, and that's a constant source of irritation. So what they're saying is that Israel will be replaced by the church. Let's go to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, and I just want to read a couple of verses to you, and I like what Steve Herzig, one of the Friends of Israel teachers and representatives says, he says, I'll tell you when Israel will be finished and Israel will have an end date, and he announces that when he goes to teach. Jeremiah 31 and verses 35 through 37, listen carefully to this. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Now, you have your Bibles open to Jeremiah chapter 31. If you look at number verse 36. Would you read that verse with me? This is Sunday school, so we can act like a class, okay? So we're going to do this. Would you read verse 36 with me? If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Have you seen that verse before? You see, 
if the sun, the moon, the sea, and the waves, and all of that, once it comes to naught, once it's no longer, that's when Israel will no longer be a nation. That's the promise to Jeremiah. And that's the promise of God. Thus saith the Lord, we see in verse 35. 37 says, thus saith the Lord, if heaven can if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. So if man can do these things, then Israel can come to an end. But since heaven cannot be measured, isn't it interesting how that even today they're finding new universes? Like, like when you went to school, as I did, many years ago, Pluto was a planet. If you didn't include that in your science test and you miss Pluto as the ninth planet, then you would have a mark of X. You are wrong. Try to put pl Pluto as a planet today in school and see if you get an X or a check mark. Well, they said it's not a planet. So science changes. They change their mind about things. But since Pluto is no longer a planet, but now they found out that there's other universes in, a, in, in, in a addition to the one that we're trying to measure, the one we're trying to figure out. How are they going to figure out that? So really, God is saying, it's so vast. If you can measure it, and if you can come to a final conclusion of it all, if you can know everything about the depth of the, of the Earth, and they're still discovering so many things inside the Earth itself, he said, then it put, it put, put Israel to an end. What is the very simple promise here? The simple promise here is that Israel has no end as long as this world stands. That's the simple promise. As long as God is in charge of what is happening in the atmosphere, as long as he's in charge of what's taking place in this world, Israel will be a nation. It will not come to an end. No one can defeat it. The Russians are going to try sometime very soon. They're going to have Iran with their, by that time, will probably have nuclear facility. They'll have Ethiopia. They'll have Sudan. They'll have Turkey. They'll have part of Europe. They'll have this conglomerate of confederates that are going to come upon Israel for the purpose of taking it. Israel is rich in minerals and it's a desirable place to occupy, even though it's the tiniest little spot, almost the tiniest in the world. But yet the mighty nations are trying to have it. They want it. Surely, with that military power coming down upon Israel, they'll be able to wipe it out and take it over. No. They'll come down upon the mountains of Israel, all of their forces, and God will wipe them out. If you ever wondered how can Israel rebuild the temple where the Mosque of Omar is, just think about it. God will destroy Russia and its Islamic confederates. And when they're destroyed, there will be no objection to removing the mosque. That's my thinking. That's all. I, I mean, you can take it for what it's worth. But the mosque... We don't have to blow it up. We don't have to remove it. God will do that by virtue of destroying the power behind the mosque. And it'll be over with. Romans 11. Romans 11. We, we need to go. Uh, by the way, the Friends of Israel, they're, they're, uh, they're probably one of the last groups of people that are maintaining a solid, solid understanding of Israel. They are indeed friends to Israel. They're having a prophecy conference in Cambridge next month, and I'm hoping to be able to take in some of that. But, uh, but they are dealing with Romans 9, 10, and 11, so they're calling it uh, Israel 9, 11. And so uh, that's what they're dealing with. But we don't have time to go to 9, 10, 11, but when you read the book of Romans, you come to the first end of the first eight chapters, you have doctrine, you have biblical soteriology. You come to chapter 9, 10, and 11, you've got Israel. Just God decided to take three chapters out of this amazing book and insert Israel and its promise.
chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. And then he told us how to live, chapters 12 and on. But chapter 11 and verses 25 through 27. Chapter 11, 25 through 27. Isn't it interesting? He said, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant. Oh. Uh, of, of a mystery. What mystery is that? Lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Uh, in the will of the Lord, unless God changes my mind, I intend to deal with that line tomorrow night. Uh, so that until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Then verse 26. Read this with me, class. And so... Yes, right now, by the way, I just, I just want to say it with, with love for Israel and with support for Israel, I want to say to you that Israel today is not submissive to God. They are still in rebellion. Uh, so, so, but that doesn't mean that we can be anti-Jew. It just means that we need to realize that they are not yet born again. They are not yet converted. They are still doing the best they can to obey the law that they failed at every single time for all these years. And they're still hoping to obey that law. But here's the key. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So Romans 9, 10, 11 is all about the conversion of Israel. Paul had a passion for his home people. The message, the gospel came to them, but they established their own righteousness, chapter 10. And then chapter 11, he said to the Roman Christians and to the Christians at large, don't be ignorant about this because that nation that you may think you're replacing is not being replaced by you. You are privileged to be the church. We are privileged to be the church. We have a huge responsibility as a church. We need, must not fail in our duties and responsibilities of the church. We're not Jew, we're not Israel, we are the church of Jesus Christ. And so the obligations to the church are ours, but we should not be foolish and ignorant about the mystery concerning Israel, because God will deliver Israel. He said, verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as teaching the election they are beloved for the father's sakes Israel is beloved of God from the very get go Israel has gone through the mill of chastisement and punishment and even up until today but God's focal point upon the nation of Israel is to reorder them reestablish them and give them the blessing of the inheritance of the land, which is called the kingdom of God on earth. Israel will be the front runner in that nation in the days to come. Pastor, my time says about 9, 12, 10 45, so I'm going to cut it off here. Do we have time for any questions? Or Okay, if you have any time, if you have a question, and by the way, if, if you don't have a question now, you want to text it, that's fine too. Yes, there's a lady over here. Okay, uh, that's a very good question. A lot of people don't, don't understand the difference. The temple that is going to be rebuilt will be rebuilt for the purpose of the Antichrist. Okay, so sometime in the near future, whenever that is, we can't even guess when that is, there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem sometime after the Russian invasion so that they can build it on the place where the, where the, where the mosque is they will build it and they will begin their sacrifice. Probably the red heifer will have a lot to do with it. And then when they are in the midst of the seven year period of tribulation, the Antichrist 
just like Antiochus Epiphanes in the Old Testament walks into the temple and says, I am your God, there is no God beside me. Then they realize that they have again been fooled. So yes, there will be that temple, but that's not the kingdom temple. The kingdom temple comes in the millennial reign. Thank you, good question. Like I say, if, if you feel like you don't really want to ask a question publicly, you can text it to my phone number and uh, maybe Pastor can put it up on screen somewhere through the conference. Then we can read the text and see how we can answer that. Because some people would rather not ask in public. I understand that. I never was the guy in class that put my hand up. I have a question, I have a question. I was never that guy. And the guys that did, I said, don't take up the class. Anyway. Uh, but but we think that if you have a question, it's because you want to learn something. Pastor? Yeah. 